Costa Brava, the wild coast, is the romantic coast of Catalonia, which, theoretically, reaches from the French border to Blanes, but actually to Barcelona. Caracas is the most original settlement of Costa Brava. It can be reached on winding mountain roads. Cape Kraus, the easternmost point of Catalonia, occasionally reveals its full beauty as it unfolds before us along the roadside. Caracas existed as a fishing village for centuries. In 1543, the entire settlement was burnt down by pirates of Caridena Barbarossa. Also, most of the settlers lost their lives. Later, they could successfully resist the attacks. Then, under the leadership of Salvador Dali, they resisted the mass tourism of General Franco as well and did not let the little houses be pulled down to make way for concrete blocks instead. The artist persuaded local people to think long-term, and today it has been clearly established that he was right. The only possible way is the conservation of values and atmosphere of the settlements, rejecting uniformity and short-term interests. Unfortunately, this is not accepted globally. Costa Brava has very few settlements that have preserved their quaint buildings in such good condition. All of the houses are whitewashed and the highest building is still the parish church. The world-famous Baroque retablo is the work of Jacint Moreto and Pau Costa. It's remarkable also for the fact that it weathered the storm of the Spanish Civil War intact. It's generally said to be the most beautiful settlement of the area, and those who don't rove the alleys of this little town of 1,500 residents don't see very much of Costa Brava. The fact that the painting school boasting names like Dali, Picasso, Matisse, Max Ernst, Duchamp, Utrillo, and Elouard was founded here can also be attributed to the intactness of Caracas. The two most famous figures of Spanish literature, Garcia Lorca and Garcia Marquez, lived here. Luis Buñuel also spent his summer holiday here on Dali's invitation. It's surprising how many famous artists Spain, and particularly Catalonia, have given to the world particularly in the field of fine arts and architecture. In musical life, the cellist Pablo Casals can be mentioned. Maybe it's only Catalan literature that has not managed to cross the borders of the province and unknowingness. Is it possible that the name of Juan Maragall, Merce Rodareda, or Llorenz Villalonga might be as popular one day as that of Paulo Coelho? The statue of Dali stands on the coastal promenade today. His father is a native son, and the painter spent all his summer vacations here. There are three art museums in Caracas, one of them is the richest private collection of Europe that belongs to the Perot Moore Foundation. The collection shows the best drawings of five centuries with artworks by Raffaello, Caravaggio, Van Dyck, Rubens, Tiepolo, Goya, Rodin, Matisse, and others. The photo gallery exhibiting some of the family pictures of Dali taken mainly in Caracas and Portugat is also very interesting. We should definitely see the blue frame decorated house at the seaside in which Picasso lived in 1910. A plaque on the wall commemorates the artist Picasso, who was born in Malaga, lived all around southern Europe. He was fond of the Spanish and French landscape and of the sea, but spent most of his life in Paris. The 
quiet little bay where Dali lived with his wife, Gala, lies only half an hour away from Kadakas. Port Yigat is a fabulous tiny fishing village. The terraced, whitewashed house had an inspiring effect on Mr. Surrealism, and it stands only a few steps away from the sea. The building can easily be recognized from the egg ornaments that were so characteristic of Dali. There's no other external sign of the fact that we see the home of the famous painter. In his life, he tried to keep secret where he lived and worked. The exhibitionist artist liked to show his artworks and himself only when he thought it good. The memorial room furnished in the house focuses not on the artist, but on the person. The skeleton of the exhibition consists of furnishings and articles of personal use, books, painting equipment, and photographs. The little yard, fruit trees, and everyday garden shed, the old fishing boat standing in the garden, bear no surreal meaning. From the window, we can still see the fishing cogs that floated in this bay centuries ago. The colorful cogs floating in the shimmering water are reminiscent of an Impressionist artwork. However, they sometimes appear on the canvases of Dali. San Pere de Rodas is one of the oldest ecclesiastical groups of buildings in Catalonia. The scenic ruins of the monastery rise above Port de la Selva on the mountain Sierra de Montana Negra. The word selva means jungle and probably refers to the impassable forest that made the monastery simply impossible to approach for long centuries. The little village in the shadow of the monastery could be approached only from the sea up to the 20th century. Nowadays, there's a highway leading to the parking lot built at the foot of the mountain from where the monastery can be reached quite comfortably, but by a steep staircase. Those who would like to visit the ruins of San Salvador Fortress that rises on Mount St. Pere de Rodas, 600 meters above sea level, can expect more physical effort. The impressive Benedictine monastery was built on the foundations of a former temple of Venus, probably in 879. Its three-nave Romanesque church was consecrated in 1022. Today this church is the part of the monument group that has remained mostly intact. A yard with an atrium leads to the entrance. One of its three-storied bell towers is of Lombardian Roman style, while the other one is without any ornaments and windows. The fact that the pillars holding the barrel vault show partly Frank, partly Arabic influence refers to more alterations of the building. The monastery was famous for its codices in the Middle Ages. Some pieces of the codices can be seen in the local museum, some in different Spanish museums, among many others in Barcelona and Madrid, but the most interesting, the so-called Rodai Codex, is in Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. Its illustrations are world-renowned. It's almost impossible to imagine today how difficult it was to build the church, monastery, and fortress on the densely forested mountainside. Several famous ecclesiastical and lay people, rulers, and aristocrats went on pilgrimage here. Their donations brought unprecedented wealth to the monastery, which proved to be its downfall. The money significantly weakened the virtue of the once devout brothers. Contemporary chronicles state that at first the monks just dealt with people from the village below, but later they demanded visits of young girls and boys in return. It was said that many barrels of wine were consumed, and the monastery got such a bad reputation that the money dried up and pious pilgrims avoided Santa Rodas. It was neglected and looted by gangs of robbers. The history of the fortress of San Salvador is much more mysterious, but not documented in such detail. We don't know exactly when and who built it. 
We don't even know who destroyed the building. It's sure, however, that the view of the monastery, Costa Brava, and the Pyrenees is the best from here, the desolate ruins. No doubt everyone has learned about everything there is to know about the Holy Grail since the success of the Da Vinci Code. It is, however, less well known that the Holy Grail, whatever it is, was kept in San Salvador Fortress. The Bay of Roses is a phenomenon in Costa Brava. Its location is simply beautiful, with the sometimes snow-capped Pyrenees in the background. People lived in this pleasant place even in the Stone Age. In ancient times, Greek settlers came here from the island of Rhodes, and the name of the bay is said to have been given by them. Since then, there have been three roses in the coat of arms of the town. They were followed by the Romans and Visigoths. In the Middle Ages, Roses was the military base of the Catalan fleet. In 1354, 300 warships left from here to defeat a rebellion on the island of Sardinia that was under Catalan rule at the time. The Spanish Armada left from the nearby harbor to the Battle of Lepanto. Later, fishing and coral trading largely contributed to the prosperity of the town. The 20th century marred the landscape with concrete blocks that were considered modern at that time. Tearing them down has been out of the question so far, but the newly built hotels and apartments are much more aesthetic. The sea is invariably beautiful and clean. The water deepens slowly here, and there are no romantic rocks protruding from it, but it's perfect for those who can't swim. The waves are also weak, so people set their folding chairs right out in the water. The name of the central beach is Badia de Roses, but we can also bathe in several smaller bays. The best known are Cala Mosca, Cala Yado, and Platia de Santa Margarita. Those fond of plants and flowers must not miss the famous botanical garden of roses, which we can reach from the beach by a free microbus. The characteristic dance of Catalans, the Sardana, is danced on the main square and mainly on Saturdays. On the other side of the coastal promenade, the huge pentagonal citadel with its thick walls was erected at the order of Charles V, but the base walls of the fortress are from Greco-Roman times. Thousands of soldiers were stationed in the huge area once. Later, it was destroyed by the French, but churches and ruins in the spacious closed area provide interesting sites nowadays, too. Catalans, who are extremely proud of the old monuments of their nation, not only renovated the old fortress, but also tried to fill it up with visitors. They furnished museums and exhibition rooms and held cultural presentations, concerts, and they even issued a quarterly talking about the latest excavations which functioned as a program brochure at the same time. The town has two other fortresses and two bastions. The thick gray walls of Castillo de Trinidad can clearly be seen from the beach. The fortress protected roses from pirate attacks with five cannons. A lighthouse has been operating nearby for centuries, which today is, of course, equipped with the latest technology. Only modest ruins of the former fortress of the Visigoths, the Castro Visigothic, can be seen. The medieval defense bastions of the hill east of the town, Torre Marina and Torre Mosaica, are much more spectacular. There are numerous tourist paths leading from Roses to the neighboring hills. The 605-meter-high Alpeni is especially beautiful from where we can see even the Cape of Kreus. The trip, whether we walk or go by bicycle, is advisable either in spring or in autumn, when the weather is not very hot. Near Roses, you can find the biggest megalith of Catalonia, the 5 by 2.5 meter Dolmen de la Creu de Cobertia, and a cave from the Stone Age. Several other smaller dolmens and graves from the Stone Age have also been excavated.
Rambla, the shady main square, is the center of social life in Figueras too. Here stands the statue of Narciso Monturio, the 19th century inventor, a native son of Figueras. The wooden submarine Icteneo, which sailed into the harbor of Barcelona to enthusiastic acclaim, was created by him in 1861. The ship is still in the harbor, not far from the Naval Museum, but in the graving dock. Figueres was made well known by its son, Salvador Dali, in the 20th century, although the king gave it its municipal title in 1267. Its fortress, the Castello de San Ferran, is the second biggest one in Europe. 10,000 soldiers can be stationed here at the same time. The 14th century Gothic St. Pere church rises in the middle of the town. The reason why a lot of people visit Figueras is the former theater, which was basically altered and reopened as Teatro Museo Dali. The 14-year-old artist held his first exhibition here. The master oversaw the renovation of the secessionist building damaged in a civil war, while the dome covering the central square is the work of Emily Perez Pinheiro. The surrealist artworks amaze hundreds of thousands of visitors every year. There are plenty of them even on the square in front of the museum. Not only paintings, but also statues, moving statues, and installations can be seen here. All of them are products of the master's bewitching fantasy. Dali worked confidently in several artistic fields. Besides his 1,500 paintings, he created several book illustrations and statues. He designed the dream sequences of the Hitchcock film Spellbound. Together with Luis Buñuel, he created the everlasting surrealistic work of art, An Andalusian Dog. Furthermore, he created cartoons for Walt Disney, too. In America, he was called Mr. Surrealism. He was an artist with exceptional talent whose life and work was highly influenced by sexuality, despite the fact that he was madly in love with his wife all his life. Every good painter who decides to create really great works of art should marry my wife first. Gala is able to cure a man's mind and respects the pictures more than a painter. He wrote about her. Dali was a truly prolific artist. He has six permanent museums in different locales. Moreover, more or less significant traveling exhibitions also show his works. The richest collection belongs to the museum in Figueras, but if we are in Catalonia, we should also visit the exhibitions in Cadaqués and Barcelona. There are those very enthusiastic fans, art historians, or students of the Academy of Fine Arts who visit the Teatro Museo Dali every day of the week and always discover something new that they had not examined thoroughly. The master was laid to rest here, in the museum that is impressive both inside and out. He's thought to have whispered his will into the ears of the mayor of Figueras, there were no witnesses, so we can only hope that Dali was put in the place he wanted to be put. He rests under one of the unmarked stones of the floor, and hundreds of unsuspecting visitors might walk on top of it every day. The scandalous artist with his twisted beard once stated that he would have liked his mummified body to be added to his more significant exhibitions in a glass coffin. Instead, a wax replica travels around the world in a glass coffin. Everything reminds us of Dali in the city. In souvenir shops with fancy names such as Dalicatessen or Art Surrealista, we can buy souvenirs that are in connection with him. His famous paintings can be bought on posters, calendars, postcards, even on t-shirts. His strokes of genius, for instance, the melting clocks from the persistence of memory, can be bought in the form of a ceramic ashtray, 
pencil sharpener, or desk lamp do. Bookstores offer dozens of art albums and biographies. The whole city of Besalú is a historical, artistic, medieval monument and one of the best preserved in Catalonia. It's a real journey into the past. The town, with altogether 2,000 residents, attracts thousands of tourists. A bulky, nine-span stone bridge crossing Rio Fluvia leads to the old town. Pont Val, the old bridge, has been the southeastern gate of the town since the 12th century. The Romanesque bridge is guarded by two Gothic watchtowers. Besalú was the center of one of the provinces both under Roman and Visigoth rule. Some parts of the town wall still exist today. On the intimate main square, the Plaza Mayor, you will find the town hall as well as the former royal court. Under the arcades, we can find shops, banks, and the tourist office, where you can get a free map. This is the place from where we can leave to see the Roman-style St. Vicenz Church, the elements of which reflect early Gothic influence, as well as the ruins, ambulatory, and bell tower of Monastir de Saint Pere Monastery. The facade of the 12th century three-nave parish church is decorated with lion embossments. The barrel vaulted sanctuary is framed by an Italian-style carved colonnade. The old synagogue does not exist today. The ritual Jewish bath, however, still stands there. The two-storied arcaded gallery of Casa Laudis, which stands at the corner of Carrer de Comte Telefero, reminds us of Italian monasteries, but it would be a good scene for Romeo and Juliet, too. The sun-kissed ancient ruins of Castel de Besalú were in their glory about 1000 AD. Later, domed Gothic buildings were raised on the Roman foundation walls. The thick walls, massive doors, and dark grids are in sharp contrast to the lively shops that are now to be found in the houses. The windows of the town prison are made lively by colorful flowers. Some cars are parked on the cobblestone squares. On one of the squares, soft drinks and ice cream are sold under colorful beach umbrellas. We can buy local souvenirs in several shops. Ceramics are especially characteristic. Those who are interested can take a tiny clay model of the old bridge home. Here, where the sun always shines, sundials are very popular, available in a lot of variations. When we reach the end of the town, we can walk back to the bridge below green gardens along the former castle wall. Castello d'Ampurias, which has 2,500 residents today, was the seat of the archbishop even in the 8th century. The town is located on the banks of the Muga River, which is crossed by a seven-span Gothic bridge. It functioned as the count's residence from the end of the 11th century to 1402. Some parts of the manor can be seen in San Dominic Monastery. The Cathedral of Emporius, otherwise called Santa Maria de Castello Church, was given its present shape in the 11th century. Its bell tower still shows Gothic features. Its facade is also Gothic. The windows of the three apses are lanceted. Statues of the Twelve Apostles can be seen on the marble portal the Adoration of the Magi on the pediment. The high altar depicts the scenes from the Way of the Cross. It was made by Vicente Boras in 1435. It's worth mentioning the treasures of the sacristy, the wonders of silversmithing of the 18th century. 
The crypt of Count Hugo Punk can be found in the old church. The special modern holiday resort of Ampuria Brava, broken by 30-kilometer-long narrow channels, is built on the coast of Castello de Ampurias. The purpose of the builders was for every cottage to have its own boat harbor. Larger yachts use a separate bay. Ampuria Brava is the center of water and aerial sports in Costa Brava, with its own aviation field, as well as the biggest parachute club in Europe. Water skiing, sailing, surfing, and diving are taught by well-qualified professionals. Girona is a provincial seat, and charter flights arrive at its airport. The zigzagging old town built on the coast of Rio Onyar is one of the most beautiful ones in the whole country offering perfect day trips if the weather is not too hot. The city with its 90,000 inhabitants and its inimitable southern atmosphere can take pride in a glorious past of 2,500 years. The settlement was established in the 5th century BC by Iberians, followed by the Romans. The fortified Roman settlement took a triangular territory at the estuary of the four rivers, Ter, Onyar, Galigans, and Guel. The Via Augusta, heading towards Madrid, led through this territory. The city, living under Arabic rule, was liberated by the troops of Charles the Great. From that time on, Girona was the seat of the oldest Catalan county. San Feliu, or Saint Felix, after whom the city was named, was the Archbishop of Girona. The three-nave church at the foot of the cathedral also bears his name. The modest church raised above the grave of the saint was replaced in the 12th century by the present-day Romanesque church with Baroque facade. Saint Narcissus, the patron saint of the city, rests beside Saint Felix in the beautifully carved stone sarcophaguses. General Alvarez de Castro, who defended the city against Napoleon, lies right alongside them. Napoleon besieged the city for seven months, but in vain. After this time, Girona was given the title Noble, Excellent, Very Loyal, and Threefold Immortal. The quiet Mediterranean garden stretching behind the cathedral once belonged to the St. Daniel Nernery. Today, anyone can make a stop to relax here. Here stands the Arabic bath, which is interesting for the fact that it was built in Moorish style 400 years after the Arabs had been driven out of the city. Its layout follows the design of classical Roman spas. Girona Cathedral is outstanding even among the so many excellent Spanish ecclesiastical buildings. Catedral de Santa Maria dominates the cityscape even from the distance. A monumental staircase of 86 steps leads to the main gate of the building that rises in the middle of Berry Val. According to the first 11th century designs, the building should have had three naves, but later the one-nave design was chosen. Work began on the Baroque facade in 1680, and almost a century later, on the bell tower. The impressive staircase dates from the 18th century. The main entrance of the church is the work of Pere Costa, and above the gate, we can see the allegorical statues of faith, hope, and love, and nearby the marble statues of the Virgin Mary and the Apostles. The 50-meter-long, 23-meter-wide, and 34-meter-high nave is the widest Gothic creation of this type in Europe. The silver decorations on the high altar, carved of a single piece of alabaster, are the works of 14th-century Catalan artists. The priceless tapestry, which depicts the story of Adam and Eve in 30 parts, was exhibited in the treasury. A lot of parts of the original Roman building have remained, including wonderful examples of Roman architecture and sculpture, the 56 pillars surrounding an ancient courtyard.
The devotional object collection of the Palace of the Archbishop is unique in its own way, especially followed by an evening walk on the Queen Johanna Promenade or on Rambla de la Libertad. The scenic old town with its covered passageways, staircases and arches stretches to the riverbank. Under the arcades of Carrer de las Bellas Terrellas and Rambla, a lot of shops and restaurants beckon passers-by. There are tapas bars where we can take the edge off our appetite with an appetizer. Delicious hams, yamon serrano, hang on the walls of pubs, and we can taste a lot of local variants of paella, which are made not only with rice, but with pasta. Don't miss churros, which is an oblong donut fried in oil, and with it, you must drink the famous Spanish almond milk, horchata, in one of the intimate bars. Although sangria goes down well, we must not forget about the excellent Spanish wines either. Moreover, those who prefer beer will be positively surprised at local specialties such as San Miguel. We can find pleasant little confectionaries and ice cream bars at every step of the road along the sea. The beautiful sandy beach and the huge boat harbor of Palamos serve tourists. However, the town lives not only from and for tourism. It's a bit off the beaten track of Costa Brava. Its harbor looks back to a glorious historic past. The wood of the nearby cork oak forest is processed by local firms. Moreover, Palamos is the most influential Spanish harbor for cork wood export. In 1299, the Catalan fleet left from here to conquer Sicily. Spanish Catholic kings also used this place to launch their armada, which defeated the Ottoman fleet that was thought to have been unbeatable. Cervantes, author of Don Quixote, lost an arm in this battle, then was captured and enslaved in Algeria for five years. The harbor was also damaged by Barbarossa, the pirate who attacked Cadacus too, but later the Spanish Civil War did not spare it either. The huge anchoring place is divided into three parts today, tourist, trade, and fishing parts. Pleasure boats also depart from here, even fishing tours are organized. Those who can water ski can try a parachute drawn by a motorboat. We can also go on a sunset tour with romantic old sailing boats. The colorful fishing harbor is a fascinating spot where especially sharks or other big fish are hooked. The beautiful shells that get caught in the net are also for sale, and here they're cheaper than at the souvenir sellers. In Palamos, there is a seashell museum too, with a collection of thousands of pieces. The little covered fish market where auctions are held at dawn is popular among tourists as well. The fish that were swimming in the sea a couple of hours before now wait for their unfortunate fate in the freezers. Their tuna, sawfish, cod, sunfish, rockfish, red barb, even smaller sharks among them. The rosy-colored tone of crabs provides a contrast to the silver mass of the tiny anchovies. Enjoy the exotic variety of seafood, ray, cuttlefish, innumerable varieties of clams, octopuses, and more. Restaurant owners from the area, as well as housewives, purchase absolutely fresh ingredients here. San Felio de Guisols is the biggest city of the coast with its 17,000 inhabitants. It was named in part after St. Felix, who drowned here in 304 AD. Iberians and Romans, Moors and Charles the Great, an eventful past. The city is called the capital, sometimes even the queen of Costa Brava. 
Brigo, king of the Iberians, was the first to build a fortress on the coast of the bay. It was occupied by the Moors some centuries later, then regained by Charles the Great. San Filio is a prosperous holiday resort that meets every demand with its pleasant hotels and several cultural programs. The coastal promenade, Passaic Maritime, is reminiscent of the French Riviera. There's a quiet park stretching behind it. It's worth seeing the archaeological museum of the city and the monument of the poet Ferran Agullo. It was he who gave the name Costa Brava to the coast. Those who are interested in playing chess cannot miss Casino La Castancia. The little Moorish-style cottage decorated with mosaics is the mecca of the lovers of this game. Pedestrian zones leaving from the coastal park lead to the old town where the ruins of a 10th century Benedict monastery can be found on Placa de Monastir. San Filio de Guisol's monastery once played an important role in the life of the city. It was built as a fortress which was destined to protect the city from the attacks of pirates from Mallorca and Berber. The head of the Council of the Wise Men governing the settlement was the abbot of this monastery for centuries. The mountain road winding 500 meters between San Feliu and Tosa provides a remarkable view. Certain points of the whimsically curving road offer a view of the sea, of vineyards, or orange and olive tree groves. Round huts built of flat slate stand on cultivated lands that follow traditions of thousands of years. Similar ancient buildings can be found on the island of Sardinia, too. The location of Tossa de Mar is similar to those of other holiday resorts in Costa Brava. A crescent-shaped bay is closed by two rocks here, as in Lloret, Palamos, San Felio, or Blanas. The rocks, however, are higher here, the bay is more arched, and the city is friendlier and more original. Tossa, which lies in the middle of the most fashionable beach, is visited by tourists who travel here for the beautiful beaches. Only when they're here do they realize how much they've received. More than a hotel city stretching along a common sandy coast, the attitude here is the same that Dali instilled in the hearts of people in Caracas. They preserve traditions and atmosphere instead of crowding people into cement eyesores. The beach is separated from the promenade by a narrow channel spanned by little bridges. Under interminable lines of colorful beach umbrellas, tourists can enjoy Spanish sunshine, and there's plenty of it in Costa Brava. That's why siesta is taken seriously in summer. It's not advisable to bathe, not even to lie in the sun. In the three months of peak season, the average daily temperature reaches 28 degrees Celsius, the number of sunny hours is 10, and the average temperature of the sea is 24 degrees. In these months, the number of rainy days is three per month, so we can't count on many refreshing rain showers. The old town, Via Vella, was built on a higher southern rock enclosing the bay. The town walls were erected as protection against pirates in the 12th century. Its three round towers, Torre de Codolar, Torre de las Horas, and Torre de Ioannas, dominate the cityscape even from a distance. Intimate terraced restaurants are easy to find where we can taste fish dishes, zazuela, and other Catalan specialties. For those who are fond of gastronomy, San Palma Fish Restaurant can be recommended, and of course, Esmoli, which is set up in an old mill. Those who long for even more can visit the ruins and mosaics of an ancient Roman cottage on Avenida de Pellegri. The jewel of the municipal museum, located in the former palace of the governor, is the Celestial Violinist by Chagall, which was painted here. At the end of the summer, fireworks see the season out. The cobblestone alleys creeping to the mountain are worth climbing just for the sake of the fascinating view. At our feet, 
Curving among rocks, the sea undulates. From here, we can look back to the colorful beach, crowded by bathers, while if we go up to the lighthouse, a scenic view opens up of the high sea and romantic rocks penetrating from it. Near the coast, white pleasure boats carry tourists. The boats anchor at almost every beach, so those who don't have a car can easily get to the next resort this way. Mountain climbing is very tiring in hot weather, but fortunately, bars along the road offer refreshments. Perhaps sangria is the best known Spanish drink. On a hot day, it's a good thirst quencher. It's a kind of punch made of red wine, grape juice and orange juice, served with orange and lemon rings, grapes and ice cubes. Bottles of it are sold on every doorstep. In the curve of the old town, on the hill, stand the ruins of the first parish church of the city, the Gothic Iglesia de Sant Marti. Settlers of the little town watched the sea worriedly from here whenever pirates threatened. Cannons have remained here from this time. There are only few people who come to the foot of the Faros. It's so quiet. The salty flavor of the sea blends with the smell of sun-kissed evergreens. Screaming birds fly above us in the cloudless sky. It's a true Mediterranean dream. The best known holiday resort of the area is Lloret de Mar, which is none other than one huge beach. Like the other beaches of the Catalan coast, it's a round arch covered by golden sand with high cliffs at the two ends. A car park runs along the full length of the beach, and it's quite necessary. In summer, sometimes 120,000 people squeeze into this area of a few kilometers. Apart from Madrid, most of the hotels can be found here in Spain, and there are still new ones being built. The city has a 2,000-year history, but mass tourism has removed every trace of this. First the Iberians, then the Romans settled down here, and they were followed by Italian sailors in the Middle Ages. Today, every nationality is represented. The Palace of Sacaleta stands on the northern rock. Ancient walls, jagged tower, loopholes. It looks quite authentic, though it was built by a wealthy businessman for his own pleasure in 1929. He made his childhood dream come true this way, but created the symbol of Yoret at the same time. The cliff was drilled through behind the romantic castle to lead to a little walking path. Sharp rocks protrude from the water below. This is the favorite diving board of children. The shady road leads through a pine forest. In the intimate little bays, boats and sailing boats anchor. If you feel up to it, you can walk on this romantic promenade even to Tossa from where the sea is always visible. In the opposite direction, the statue of a couple dancing the sardana can be seen on the path, as well as the replica of the Canaletis well that stands on the Rambla in Barcelona. In Museo de Lloret de Mar, we can visit an exhibition of local history, 
as well as the ruins of a Roman cottage and an ancient Roman graveyard. There's also an exhibition room of fine arts, although more visitors go to shopping malls instead. Shops are open only in the morning and in the evening because from midday to four o'clock, everyone takes refuge from the heat in their air-conditioned rooms. Only the most daring are on the beach. The town hall with its waving flag rises in the middle of the coastal promenade. On the Placa de la Iglesia hides a little 15th century Gothic parish church. Its colorful tiles and golden mosaics have been redecorated recently. Its name is San Roman, and apart from Ermita Santa Cristina, it's the only ecclesiastical building of the area. Placa lies at the intersection of the pedestrian zones, so a lot of people walk here, especially in the evenings. The streets of Yoret, behind the coastal promenade, are alive with tourists from spring to autumn. Life is always busy here. It's one of the disco centers of Europe where masses of people are allured by the magic of Mediterranean nights. The smell of suntan lotion lingers in the vapor of the sea. Noises of exhilaration pierce the air. Children scream as the waves crash in. It's a cavalcade of colorful beach umbrellas and bikinis, life-giving sun rays, and refreshing icy drinks. Scenes which are always good to remember. Snack bars compete with each other, which one gives the largest cocktail or the most delicious parfaits. We can choose among fast food restaurants, Spanish, Mexican, Italian, and Chinese restaurants, according to our taste. A statue of a woman looking in the distance stands on the southern rock. She's rarely alone. Standing beside her, we can also enjoy the life of the beach and the endless sea. The 580 kilometer long Mediterranean coastline of Catalonia is divided into three parts. Costa Brava stretches from the French border to Blanes. The area between the estuary of Tordera and Barcelona is called Costa de Levante. It's gradually losing its autonomy and is slowly merging with the expanding Costa Brava. Costa de Poniente stretches from Barcelona to the Delta of Ebro. The much more well-known Costa Dorada belongs to this. Ermita Santa Cristina can be found south of Lloret on an intimate mountainside. The small church was first mentioned in 1376 and was rebuilt in Baroque style in 1764. The altar cabin is a bit younger and the marble altar comes from Italy. The statue of St. Christina is a modern piece of art based on a contemporary painting. St. Christina, after whom the church was named, was shot to death with an arrow in her home and her body was thrown into the sea. Fishermen from Lloret found the body in an absolutely sound condition. The body was taken home to Italy where only one tooth was preserved and this is always presented, surrounded by a wreath of flowers on the day commemorating the saint. The festival is held on June 24th every year when fishing boats and ships decorated with flowers appear in a spectacular procession. For fans of plant life, there's a little botanical garden showing cactuses and succulents nearby. We can have a look at little romantic beaches and hidden bays framed by pine forests from the terrace in front of the church. These perfect bathing places can be approached on foot from the parking place of Ermita Santa Cristina through steep but shady promenades. Scheduled tourist boats leaving from larger beaches don't stop here so as not to disturb the tranquility of the bay. In some villages, we can also bargain with fishermen, boatmen, or simply hire some kind of watercraft to roam around the romantic coast. Paralada is a little town of 1,300 residents north of Figueras, among vineyards in the open country. 
The good local white wine is frequently offered in the small restaurants of the area, especially with fish dishes. Its 16th century bulky water castle with its two cylindrical bastions is a real tourist site. The Gothic building facing the lake was redone in the 19th century by a French architect. A casino has been operating in it since then, so it can be visited only in the evenings from 6 p.m. to 3 a.m. Those who would like to play baccarat or roulette here should pay attention to proper clothing, as a tie is compulsory for men, and don't leave your passport in the hotel either. In the bar, with its elegant noble atmosphere, we can drink a cocktail, celebrating with joy, or washing down our sorrows. The best known site of Barcelona is Sagrada Familia, or Holy Family Basilica, that has been under construction since 1882, yet has not been finished. This masterpiece of Catalan Art Nouveau alone attracts crowds of tourists into the city. After his death in 1926, Gaudi was placed, with papal permission, in his final resting place here, in the middle of his chief work of art. His creation hasn't been finished because no architect has been found who would take on the implementation using traditional techniques. For this reason, the plans have been adjusted to use reinforced concrete. According to Gaudi's wishes, the construction should be financed by private donations so that the church would have no say in the plans. Still under construction today, the tower will be 170 meters tall. It will be the future church of the Sagrada family, just as organic architecture also belongs to the future. Gaudi said that if the material is pure, it will unfold in its own astral curves, and then the world can finally foresee the configuration of paradise. Gaudi was run over by a streetcar. Caesar Manrique died in a car accident. Hundert Wasser had a heart attack on a ship. Will there ever be an architect who can protect their heritage and carry on their ideas? Although the master built several residential houses in the Catalan capital city, the most popular among them are Casa Batillo and Casa Mila on Paseo Gracia Avenue. Both houses are full of imagination and playfulness. Guel Park belongs to the synthesis of Art Nouveau and organic architecture the undulating terrace of which is supported by a monumentally columned portico, also designed by Gaudi. Here you can see the mosaic statue of the gargoyle iguana, which greets us from almost every Barcelonan souvenir. Also the former residential house of the artist can be found in the park. The huge brick arch standing in front of the Ciudadela Park, which also includes the zoo, was originally the gate to the 1888 World's Fair. Created by Josep Vilaseca, the arch is ornamented by the Catalonian coat of arms and statues of a winged man. The medieval cathedral of Barcelona, Santa Eulalia, stands in the Gothic quarter. The five-towered ecclesiastical building is closely embraced by medieval houses, only its facade faces the spacious Plaza de la Sue. The cathedral has been under construction for many years, but it can be visited inside. The dimensions of the church inside are simply amazing. It's 82 meters long, the height of its dome is 45 meters, and it has altogether 28 chapels. The statue of Christ that was the fiddlehead of the victorious ship of Don Juan de Austria in the Battle of Lepanto, stands in the Manducation Chapel. The alabaster sarcophagus of the name-giving Saint Olalia stands in the middle of a separate crypt. The martyr has become the patron saint of the city. The ambulatory of the church can be approached by a carved gate that has remained from the 11th century. A little fountain gurgles in the middle of the monastic garden, 
where the yard is planted with palm trees and magnolia trees. Once a Roman, then an Arabic settlement stood where the Gothic district of Barcelona stands today. Later, it was taken by the city center that was created under the rule of Catholic kings. The Grand Royal Palace, the Governor's Palace, the Old House of Charity, the City Hall, several other ecclesiastical buildings, and the National Gallery of Catalan were built at that time. These all embraced the cathedral and formed together the nicely uniformed Gothic Quarter. The Spanish have always had a great respect for their ancestors. A time-worn arched palace in the old city houses the museum in honor of the Malaga-born Pablo Picasso. Just a few steps from here is the Barcelona exhibition of the father of surrealism, Salvador Dali. Hundreds of pigeons waddle on the huge square of Plaza de Catalunya, framed by fountains, just like on St. Mark's Square in Venice. This is one of the busiest junctions of the city, the departure place of the Rambla. Moreover, this is the terminal of sightseeing buses too. It's framed by modern office buildings and stores. You can find a Rambla in every Spanish town, even in Latin America. Actually, it functions as a main square or a marketplace so this is the center of the hustle and bustle of everyday life. It resembles a long street more than a square. The Rambla in Barcelona, which is called the Rambla of Flowers, is extremely beautiful and lively. Its atmosphere is created by the little stalls of news agents, florists, and pet traders, as well as by performers dressed as statues. Some of them have quite artistic performances. Rambla has existed in this form since 1860, but its history goes back 2,000 years. It received its name from the cartographers of Julius Caesar, who called the area next to the city walls of Rome the same. The market of San Jose is the stomach of the city. It's an iron frame market hall it was created by Josep Fonsera at the time of Eiffel, when throughout Europe, steel was being used as a construction material. In the market hall, fishmongers, butchers, bakers, and greengrocers offer their beautiful portraits. Rambla would not be complete without its portrait drawers and caricaturists. The Teatro Principal was built by order of King Philip II, who kindly allowed theater productions to be held for the patients in the St. Cross Hospital. Museo de Serra is none other than a wax museum, a panopticum. Placa Real is surrounded by arcaded, three-storied houses with completely uniform facades. Fountains, statues, and palm trees make the square more intimate. These are the palm trees of Gaudi that come from the childhood of the artist. The square was one of Francesco Molina's dreams in 1848. In those revolutionary times, it was named after Garibaldi. The Columbus Column has become the symbol of Barcelona. Standing nearly 70 meters high, this masterpiece was designed by Gaeva Monrava. There's a fast elevator in the column that takes people to the base of the statue, inside the globe, from where there is an amazing view to the port, the Rambla, and Montjuic Hill. The Art Nouveau building of the Customs House greets travelers at the gate of the redecorated port. The new port, with its modern store, resembles most closely an airport. The 213-meter-high Montjuic Hill can be reached by car, bus, or cable train 
where among many other sites, we can admire the Museum of Catalan Arts. The cable train leading up from the port offers a fascinating panorama over one of the friendliest cities of Europe. Perhaps next year you'll be among the five million visitors to Barcelona and Costa Brava?